works are wishful, I know that full well. Mm. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in, the, in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand when I awake, I am still with you. No one completely understands how life begins or how a baby is so wonderfully formed in a mother's womb. Only God knows how to perform such a miracle. Stitch by stitch, row by row, he carefully kneads and knits each piece into place. <laughs> the Lord showed me how art ministry can be used as a tool for evangelism to move past cultural barriers that often prevent gospel conversations. So as my time in Budapest was coming to a close, I began praying, Lord, what is this next step you have for me? And through that process, the Lord made me aware as well as the Reach Global leadership um, that there is a huge gospel need as well as an opportunity to bring the gospel to Paris, France. And so as I came back to the US, I transitioned into long-term commission staff with Reach Global and accepted an invitation to join the Paris City team. A part of this transition, a part of this decision was to take a vision trip there. And as I stepped off the bus uh, from the airport, I was struck by this palpable darkness that weighs over the culture and the atmosphere and the society there. Um, and so, I'd like you guys to just take a moment and ponder a question. Instead of viewing Paris as a tourist destination, what type of spiritual darkness do you think Parisians face? So, as many of you probably know, France has a long history of being a religious country, and along with that, religion was used as this means and this source of control. And so back in 1905, the French government came in and passed a law called the Lesseti, um, or translated to secularism, which was an official separation of church and state. And this law has then grown now to, instead of just being a neutrality towards religion, France is now known for its rejection of the Bible. 
Um, it's the seventh most atheistic country in the world, and it has the highest Muslim population in all of Europe. Um, along with experiencing this spiritual darkness and feeling this weight over the society there, I also had the opportunity to meet with some people who were serving in France. And one of the people that I met is a man named Steve, who's been serving there for over 30 years. He initially came as a church planter, and he quickly learned that that wasn't going to work. He had planted this church, but couldn't get anyone to come. And he was trying to figure out why. Well, he happened to have a couple of artists who were attending the church, and they came up to him one day and said, Steve, we don't know what to do. We're having so many gospel conversations that we don't have time to do any of the other work that the Lord's called us to do, and we don't know how to balance things. And so Steve realized, okay, there's something I need to understand about the relationship between French culture and the arts. So he started to study that over the next year and a half. And through that process, he had multiple conversations with different French people. And oftentimes the conversation went something like, Steve, if, if art did not exist, there'd be no reason for me to live. And he's a bit taken aback. He's like, whoa, I, I don't understand. I don't know how to make sense of that. And he said, well, you're probably viewing that from more of an American cultural mindset. Oftentimes in the US, art is viewed as dessert. It's good sometimes, but it's not good all the time. Whereas in France, it's the main meal. It's this source of sustenance in life. So when you have a culture such as in France, where there's this history of religion being used for control, they equate Christ and the gospel to that. They don't see it as the savior of the world who's come down to rescue them. So that opens up the door through art to share the gospel. Um, the work that I'll be doing is similar to what I did in Budapest, using the practical aspects of art to build relationship and share the gospel. And it's not just to these individual artists. Art has the ability to impact culture and society and change cultural perspective. My first year in Hungary, I had the opportunity to attend a musician's networking event, essentially. And during that time, I met with a woman named Fujina, who came up to me and said, can we have a songwriting session afterwards? So we met two weeks later, and this was the, only the second time meeting her. And she presented this idea um, about her struggles with anxiety and depression written through the lens of how her mother had helped her. What I didn't know right away was that her mom had recently passed away from cancer, and so it was this process of mourning the loss of her mother and healing from this tragedy. And yet, because of the vulnerability that's needed when creating music, creating art, it opened up opportunities to share the gospel with her. Afterwards, I spoke with my boss and I said, Colin, I, I don't think you understand. I've been serving here for 12 years. And that doesn't happen. People don't just ask you to share about Christ. They don't just ask you what hope means or what peace means. And I was blown away by that time and time again, how the Lord would use this to move past these cultural barriers that were preventing that. So, yeah, um, as I'm transitioning into this new role, um, it's, it's not something that I can do alone, and the Lord's blessed me with many different people that have joined in partnership, um, people that have a burden on their hearts for the gospel to come into these dark places, to pierce that darkness. Um, and I'd love to share more with you guys about that. There are response cards on your chairs. Um, it's just some basic contact information and then um, a response of how you'd like to join. If you'd like to receive email newsletters, join in prayer or anything like that, I'd love to connect with you guys. Um, I believe Nancy King will be in the back with a basket if you guys would like to drop those in there or I'll be in the back and love to talk with you guys more. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you for your partnership over the last few years. It's been such a blessing. Thank you. You use all kinds of means to draw people to you. You make a bridge uh, with all kinds of things. And, and we thank you that you use art because there is uh, beauty in art. And there's meaning in art. And we pray that uh, as has already been the case, Collins ministry might be very fruitful and that uh, you would use 
his acquaintance with art and his own artistry to get past the cultural barriers so that people can find you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing, so I'll try to project a little bit louder than normal. But Colin and I have been sharing ideas back and forth and music-wise for like a really long time. And so I knew he was coming into town. I'm like, I, I want to play with him uh, again. So this is kind of the first time I think we've played here. Yeah. Like a kind of more an original piece. So this is one I wrote, and but Colin did a lot of the arranging on this for fun. So yeah, yeah I think it's gonna be really, really sweet and special. So. Saint, or oh, are you loving me? Took three nails, but you broke my chain. Or oh, are you loving me? Deeper than oceans I never see. Or oh, are you loving me? More than the stars outside of my reach. Or oh, are you loving me? Oh, Jane. I was privileged to grow up in a uh, Christian home, and both my parents were praying people. But my mother especially was a prayer warrior. And I can remember one time when there was something burdening her heart. And she felt compelled not only to pray, but to adopt 
a particular posture in prayer. She related to me afterward. I didn't actually see this happen, but she told me about it. She, she humbled herself and got down on the floor and crawled under the dining room table and prayed to God there, pouring out her heart. We, uh, we thank God for godly mothers, praying mothers. And there are a lot of godly mothers in the scriptures, and uh, we could have picked any number of them to think about today on Mother's Day, but I, I picked Hagar. She's not maybe the godly mother that you would think. Maybe we would have picked Sarah. She, like Abraham, was considered great in Israel and a uh, woman of faith. But I think Hagar was a godly mother too. And here's why. She had a very vital relationship with God. She was an Egyptian woman. She was a servant to Sarai, who later became Sarah, the wife of Abram, who later became Abraham. God changed their names. But Hagar had a vital relationship with God. How do we know? We know because she talked with God. The Bible records their conversations. And because she was obedient to God. You remember that Sarai and Abram could not have children, didn't have children for a long time, and uh, it was Sarah's idea that maybe she could have children through Hagar. So she gave Hagar to Abram. And Hagar did get pregnant. And after getting pregnant, Hagar came to despise Sarai. We don't know exactly how that manifested itself, but uh, she showed that uh, she was better than her mistress. And so Sarai treated her harshly and in fact sent her away. We find that story in chapter 16 of Genesis, a couple chapters ahead of where Nancy read for us. And she was sent away and she was in the wilderness and the angel of the Lord found her. When we read the angel of the Lord, we're to understand this is God in a form to whom humans can relate. And she was by a spring of water in the wilderness. And the angel of the Lord said, I want you to go back to your mistress. It must have been a very hard thing for Hagar to do, but she did. The angel of the Lord said, I want you to submit to her again. That must have been a very hard thing for her to do, but she did it. She went back with a humbled spirit. She also went back with the promise from God that she was going to have a son, and God was going to bless her through her son. She was to name him Ishmael. Maybe it was a little bit of a, a mixed blessing, because although he was going to be great, he was going to have a, a rather interesting character. This is what the angel of the Lord said. I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And then the angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, you will bear a son, you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. Mixed blessing, maybe, but a promise Nevertheless, and she went back to Sarai with that. 
We should take note of the fact that uh, everyone in this story messed up. Sarai, in trying to force an outcome ahead of God's plan, in trying to get a son through Hagar, Abram, in agreeing to Sarai's plan, he might have said to her, no, let's just wait on God's timing. Hagar, in despising her mistress, the whole ship, if we can refer to the situation in that way, was taking on water, and God worked hard with everyone to right the ship. Of interest in the narrative, while Hagar was at the spring in the wilderness, is the part in which Hagar gave God a name. Places are often named in the Bible, and God names people, sometimes before they are born, as with Ishmael, which means God hears. He heard the boy crying, or he heard Hagar crying when she was sent away while she was still pregnant. And sometimes God changes the name to reflect the transformed identity. You may remember that Jacob's name was Supplanter. He kind of took his brother Esau's place, but God changed his name to Israel after he wrestled with the angel. And Israel means one who strives with God and who comes out ahead. In Genesis 16, 13, Hagar gave a name to God. I have seen him and remain alive. That's the name that she gave to God. People didn't expect to be alive after encountering the living God. Because God is holy and people are not, and <laughs> holiness coming into contact with sinfulness, usually the sinfulness is destroyed. And yet God in his grace has left people alive. Not that anybody has seen him face to face. Moses got to see his back. Sometimes God wraps himself in a cloud or maybe appears in some other form, the angel of the Lord, kind of human form, so that people are protected and don't see his pure holiness. But Hagar named him the God whom I have seen, and yet I have remained alive. After Hagar visited with the Lord, she returned to Sarai. Ishmael was born, he was named, he grew up. He was, uh, we might say, a, a nut that didn't fall far, too far from the mother tree. Uh, as Hagar had once despised Sarai, so after Isaac was born to Sarai, now Sarah, and Abraham, and Ishmael was maybe about 14 or 15 at this time, he, he mocked Isaac. And uh, that did not sit well with Sarah, and so she sent Hagar away for a second time. <clears throat> Abraham was distressed, as Nancy read for us, but he went along. He made sure that they had some kind of provision, gave them some food and some water, but as Nancy mentioned, they, they got sent out into the desert, a place where there is loneliness, a place where there is danger, a place where there is fear. And if your water runs out, you don't have much hope of surviving long. There Hagar did what she could for Ishmael. But she realized her resources were limited, and so she walked away about as far as one could shoot an arrow. And she expected him to die, and she did not want to witness that. 
But again, God saw her and visited her and rescued her by showing her a well that had been hidden from her view. Hagar and Ishmael were saved. And we know that Hagar finished raising Ishmael. She got a wife for Ishmael from her home country, from Egypt. And Ishmael became the father of all the Arab nations, great in his own right, just as Israel became great and became the father of the Jewish nation. Hagar's actions in many ways show what a godly mother does. What do godly mothers do? Well, first off, they sometimes find things too hard to bear. We read in Genesis 21, verse 16, the first part of that verse. Hagar went and sat down opposite Ishmael, about a bow shot away, for she said, Do not let me see the boy die. It was too hard for her to bear. Sometimes godly mothers grieve over their family members. We read in that same verse that Hagar lifted up her voice and wept. She started into mourning. That's what the verse or the, the word wept means in, in Hebrew. It has that sense. Ishmael hadn't died yet, but she had already started to mourn because she assumed that that was the inevitable course of events. Mothers do that. Godly mothers do listen when God speaks. We read in the next verse, God heard the lad crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear. God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. And Hagar listened. Godly mothers listen when God speaks. And I wanted to uh, share with you God's question, what's the matter with you? That's how it reads in the Hebrew. What's the matter with you? It's not an unkind question, suggesting a lack of faith on Hagar's part. But rather, it's kind of a Jewish way of saying, did you know that there's a better outcome that's about to be revealed? There is. That's what God's what's the matter with you means. Godly mothers open their eyes and they look beyond the immediate situation, the immediate circumstance to see what God may have in store. That's what Hagar did. And there is a heavenly store full of provisions for the people that God loves. God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and lifted the skin, or filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. <clears throat> and then godly mothers show tenderness. At God's request, Hagar took Ishmael by the hand. God said, go and take him by the hand and, and lead him to that well, and she did. My uncle Bert uh, helped to raise my mom, and uh, when she was little and uh, walking next to him, he would sometimes ask her, would you like me to carry your hand? That's how he put it, and she did, and he did. Godly mothers show tenderness by carrying the hands of their children. And then godly mothers make room for God to fulfill his word. Sarah had tried to engineer an outcome, getting a son for Abraham by Hagar, which was not necessary as God was going to give her her own son. 
And in the first visit that God made to Hagar when she was still carrying Ishmael, and Ishmael had not yet been born, God gave Hagar this word that he was going to give her many descendants, and Ishmael would become great and the father of a nation, the nation of Arabs. Hagar made room for God to work, and uh, we read the fulfillment that Ishmael grew up and did have many sons. In fact, he had 12 sons. They all became princes. They all became fathers of nations. And God fulfilled that word. And Hagar made room for that to happen. And then finally, godly mothers cooperate with God to secure the future for their families. We read how Hagar got a wife for Ishmael out of Egypt, out of her home country. That is a responsibility that normally would have fallen to the father, but Abraham was not in the picture at that point. The father was not there, and so the mother had to do it. Sometimes there's a single parent family, and the mother has to do what the father would do. Mothers cooperate with God, godly ones, to help secure the future for their families. So I have a few questions for the mothers who are here today, and we include spiritual mothers because they are very significant in the lives of their spiritual children. Are there some things, mothers, that are too hard for you to bear? Maybe you have wanted to become a mother and that hasn't happened. Or maybe you have lost a child. Or maybe you had a child with a disability. Or maybe you are a parent with declining health and you can't do for your child what you want. Maybe there's been rather meager provision in your life. You don't have all the financial means that you would like to take care of your family. To you, I would offer this word of hope. Expect a visit from God in your wilderness, in your desert, in your place of loneliness and danger and fear. Another question, are you grieving something in your family? Have you anticipated a bad outcome? Have you gone into mourning even before the thing has happened? If so, hear God's question, what is the matter with you? Which is not an indictment because you have too little faith, but it's God's way of asking, did you know that there is a better outcome about to be revealed if you will wait on me and have faith? Another question. Do you have eyes that are open to see what God has for you by way of sustaining your strength until your ordeal is over? He has a heavenly store with something in store for you. All kinds of blessings are in that store. And he's also gifted most women with intuition, a way of seeing things that others don't see. There are a few men who have it too, but not many. <laughs> and while it may have some supernatural aspects, it may also be just the ability to pay attention to small cues which God knows women will apprehend so that they can gain hope. They pick up on little changes, little things that God might be doing that men don't always see. You have eyes to see what God has for you. Another question. Are you making room for God to work? Sometimes the task is simply to rest and let God do the work. I know, moms, you think that God needs help. 
But he doesn't. You don't need to control or force an outcome. He is able to do even beyond what you hope or expect. Another question, if there is something for you to do, your part in God's plan is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Are you doing what you can to secure the future for someone, especially your child or your spiritual child? Maybe the thing that you need to do is to pray. Maybe it's to be a sponsor in a baptism or in a dedication ceremony. Maybe it is teaching. Maybe it's encouraging. Maybe it is carrying somebody's hand. Maybe it's simply being there to listen and exercising what we call the ministry of presence. Sometimes we underestimate how valuable it is just that somebody is there so that we don't have to be alone. Especially where, when we are in some kind of a desert. There is a great necessity when you are a mother, or anybody for that matter, to have faith. A great necessity to have faith. I'd like to close with the lyrics of a song. The title of it is Desert Pete. It's a song about faith. It was sung by the Kingston Trio, written by a man named Billy Ed Wheeler. But I think it describes Hagar's situation, this song and the biblical narrative both take place in a desert. It might be something that will encourage you in your faith, too. I was traveling west of Buckskin on my way to a cattle run across a little cactus desert under a hot, blistering sun. I was thirsty down to my toenails, stopped to rest me on a stump. But I tell you, I just couldn't believe it when I saw that water pump. <clears throat> I took it to be a mirage at first. It'll fool a thirsty man. Then I saw a note stuck in a baking powder can. The pump is old, the note began, but she works, so give her a try. I put a new sucker washer in her. You may find the leather dry. You've got to prime the pump. You must have faith and believe. You've got to give of yourself, for you're worthy to receive. Drink all the water you can hold, wash your face, cool your feet, but leave the bottle full for others. Thank you kindly, Desert Pete. Yeah, you'll have to prime the pump, work that handle like there's a fire. Under that rock, you'll find some water left in a bitters jar. Now there's just enough to prime it with, so don't go drinking first. You just pour it in and pump like mad, buddy, and you'll quench your thirst. Well, I found that jar, and I'll tell you, nothing was ever prettier to my eye, and I was tempted strong to drink it, because that pump looked mighty dry. But the note went on, have faith, my friend, there's water down below. You've got to give until you get. I'm the one who ought to know. So I poured in the jar and I started pumping and I heard a beautiful sound of water bubbling and splashing up out of that hole in the ground. I took off my shoes and I drunk my fill of that cool, refreshing treat. I thank the Lord, and I thank the pump, and I thank Old Desert Pete. And I don't imagine Billy Ed Wheeler thought that uh, 
somebody would make this connection, but maybe Old Desert Pete is another way of mentioning the Holy Spirit. Amen.